So what came out of the reading groups? Uh, there are some questions that sort of I've, I've added to them, but I thought if maybe they are good starting points. So uh, what I've asked uh, each of the panelists is to maybe take one of those questions and then um, give us their answer to or their take or respond to one of them as a way of opening it up. So first of all, I'm gonna read them through, then I'm gonna go back to the big screen so that everyone here can, in, uh, the panelists can briefly introduce themselves. So that also gives some of us time to think. And then we're just gonna start with uh, one of them. First one, are some concepts, and this came from uh, the first reading group in particular, as, and, and also posed partly by Fiv. Are some concepts beyond rescue, and this Malu is <laughs> a term that you used, and for example, interpretation. How does the fraction relate to interpretation in post-call research? And how can the notion of interpretation be reclaimed, reappropriate, if at all? So I think that really speaks nicely to the field where you see, for example, Karen Barad, who has introduced like new terms, neologisms, but also has walked around in existing ones and uh, get, reconfigures them. And then there are maybe some that are beyond help. I don't know. So that might be worth thinking about. How do you prepare? So this is the second one. How do you prepare yourself for the indeterminacy of a diffractive reading of a text and text in the broad sense? So also the visual and oral and um, auditory, et cetera. Can you maybe give a brief example? In what way is it different from how you prepare for a reflective, reflexive reading? And I think it's especially for me, that notion of preparation. So there was quite a, little dis a lot of discussion, but what maybe do you work on as a researcher to maybe unlearn or prepare yourself for, or tell yourself not to do or to do? What, what maybe? The third one is the defective methodology involves decentering the human. You know, you see that a lot in the literature and it's also in some of the reading. And at the same time, the research is ontologically entangled. And we, it keeps coming back in our reading groups as well. Now, how does this tension of decentering but not erasing the human work in theory and in practice? Then the fourth one, a defective happening brings about difference that matters, matters in its double meaning. And you were talking about that in the last reading group. But how can we discern what matters if there is no active subject? Fifth, are some texts, and actually they might, <laughs> you might want to take two or three at the same time. Are some texts more generative to diffract through than others? And if so, can you, as a researcher, decide this beforehand? I'll put these in the, um, in the, there as well. Let me just go to chat before I forget. So let's have a quick introduction for people who also don't know and others. So just to start off, I'm um, Karen Mullis and I'm professor here of early childhood education and here, here is interesting in my case, but that's uh, the University of Oulu uh, in the north of Finland and we still got a lot, about a meter snow here, which must be really strange <laughs> at the end of March. Um, but I'm also Emerita uh, Professor of Education uh, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and I do a lot of research still in South Africa. So let me hand over Fifth to you as another panelist, or well, you're the panelist. I'm supposed to just share all of this, facilitate, difficultate this. Hi, everyone. My name's Vivian Bosilek, and um, I live in Cape Town, been living here for a very long time. And I've been interested in Karen Barad's work for a long time and 
trying to read it and study it. Um, yeah. And I have a few students who are also interested in her work and um, in, yeah, in looking at how it intersects with, with other bodies of work too. Thank you. Uh, Astrid? Hello, everyone. My name is Astrid Schrader. I'm a senior lecturer in philosophy and sociology at the University of Exeter. I work in science and technology studies, and I'm currently writing a book on haunted marine microbes using diffractive methodology by, uh, and, deconstruct and deconstruction together. And yeah, I have been a student of Canberra. Thank you. Katie? Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Strom. Um, today, I'm talking about place. Um, I'm actually in New York City with my mother. Um, and so, uh, but typically, I live in San Francisco, California, and work at California State University East Bay, um, where I teach in our educational leadership for social justice doctoral program. And um, my background was um, coming into uh, neo-materialisms kind of through the back door as a teacher, looking at my classroom and teacher preparation and saying, gosh, why are things just so complex? You know, they say that we're supposed to learn these practices and go and do them, and it just doesn't work like that. And so in a search for ways to understand classrooms as complex systems came across, um, actually, I was in an AERA um, a year a session hearing Elizabeth St. Pierre and Patty Lather talk about assemblages and lines of flight. And so I started reading Deleuze and Guattari and, and never looked back. So um, now I really sort of position myself more in a, a Bray Dotty school of, um, or <laughs> maybe Haraway's making odd kin. Let's throw all of the theories together and see what they produce. <laughs> so that's me. Thank you. Malu? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Melinska. I'm based in Copenhagen and we had some snow today as well, but it melted uh, immediately. So no one meter of snow <laughs> like in Oilo. <laughs> I actually visited Karen uh, a few years ago in September and it was snowing then as well. So there's a lot of snow in Oilo, I guess. Anyway, I yeah, yeah. I must admit that by the time it's March, you think, okay, 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 it's enough. It's enough now. <laughs> yeah, it was great. You coming here. You came to for a workshop uh, with a with the doctorate students, uh, researchers, and Astrid also uh, contributed to it. And very much at the heart of it, and I think it's worth mentioning, is your book on dialogues on agential realism, which I think is just a fantastic read. And it is also one of the very important reasons why you were invited to, to write your paper for the, which was first the encyclopedia, and then now it's going to become, become the handbook. And so it's, it's fabulous that you're, you're in this space. But Malou, I, I know I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, so, yeah, I'm in Copenhagen, but I'm at the Aarhus University and at the Education Studies, and I'm an associate professor in social psychology there. Yeah, and uh, pleased to be here and looking Thank forward you. to talking to you today. Michalinos? Thank you, Karin. Uh, my name is Michalinos Zambilas. I'm... Um, Professor of Educational Theory and Curriculum Studies at the Open University of Cyprus. And my main interest is uh, in affect theories, politics, and education. Thank, Thank you. you. And of course, um, you know, the, the other reason why we thought it would be, you know, really productive to put this panel together is that Michaelinas and Viv have written extensively on uh, on diffraction 
And also we're invited to contribute to the encyclopedia and to the handbook. And that's a Routledge encyclopedia on interpretation in qualitative research, which is one of the reasons why um, that paper talks and struggles and fights with the concept of uh, interpretation. And, um, and Katie very much, you know, when the another paper was um, submitted also on diffraction, it seemed so such a good opportunity, such a rich opportunity to bring all of that in conversation with one another. And that's what we're going to do now. So my question to any of you is, yeah, who would like to kick it off? Have you got a question that you have some ideas about, you would like to respond to? And I would say, just go ahead. And then George is going to keep time so that we spend about 10, 10 minutes for each of those. And yeah. And we do it fairly. If you've had one question, then... Your turn is up for now until we open it up completely. So who would like to kick us off? If no one if no one's going to jump in, I I'd be happy to I was always that annoying person in class in the front row. Pick me, pick me, pick me. <laughs> Not annoying at all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, don't speak too soon. I haven't given my answer yet. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I looking at these questions, there are, um, I mean, I, there are a lot that are interesting to me. Um, I think maybe um, I'll, I'll speak on... Um, two of them. So the first one um, around how do you prepare yourself for the indeterminacy of a diffractive reading of a text in the broad sense and giving an example. So one of the things I love most about this, um, you know, this orientation or, or approach to research um, is it's really predicated on um, that you know that important ontological shift I think in research towards um, not seeing what's there uh, necessarily, but in producing something. And so I always come back um, to that. I might even be the first lines of a thousand plateaus where they talk about there's nothing to read in a book. It's really you know coming together as an assemblage and what's produced by. Um, the folks that are reading it and the pages and the authors and the context and all of those things. And I think it's the same thing for these texts. Um, my So in a, a project that we did during COVID, which was really generative for us, um, and in fact was, um, you know, initially inspired by um, some of Karen and Viv's work in thinking about a diffractive review um, so we were putting, we were asked to do a book review for the relatively new uh, Journal of Matter. And during COVID, um, my, one of my very best friends, Tammy Mills and I, um, you know, we were really struggling, I think, as a lot of people were. And what we found was that when we came together to diffract the text, which for us meant, you know, we were splitting things up and we were reading because we were doing um, Bray Dottie's post-human knowledge with um, mapping the affective term, which is a big reader. And so we were sort of splitting things up and then coming together and seeing what was being produced. And in terms of what was being produced was ideas and connections, but also, um, you know, we were writing poetry together. Um, so we, we used found poetry. She was, you know, we would have screenshots of conversations that we were having, text messages um, with other folks that then we were making connections with um, and doing, you know, composite art. And so all of these things um, were what were produced. And so I think that when you're thinking about the indeterminacy, if you're not concerned with what's there, I don't think that that matters so much. If it's, if the orientation is towards what are we producing, um, then I, I think that it's, you know, it's again, it's just not something to be worried about um, because 
you know, kind of who cares what's there. It's about when you're putting it together and then doing something with it. Um, and I think that that's the other piece too around um, what it does in the world. Um, and so, uh, so, so again, for me, um, that was sort of what was generated when I was looking at uh, number two. And that, I mean, it relates to number one, I guess, in a way too, because when you're thinking about, um, you know, what it does rather than what it means, that also bumps up against, you know, those tensions with interpretation, because traditionally interpretation is always about meaning. But, you know, again, from this um, post-human slash post-qualitative new materialist, whatever you want to call it, all of the terms, right? <laughs> I call it critical complexity. Um, it nothing, there is no deeper meaning, right? Because it's all about what's produced when you're coming together with that situ those situated productions. Um, so, so that was sort of my thoughts on that. The, the more, I think, almost interesting question for me would be the combination of three and four, that notion of decentering the human, but at the same time we're entangled. And then number four, um, regarding the active subject. And so I've done a lot of thinking around this. Um, and I keep coming back to the idea that um, accounting for the entanglement of the human in any, any work with the post-human and in post-qualitative, um, it's an ethical political question. And so I err on the side of um, Rosie Braydotti when she says, we have to account for ourselves being simultaneously embedded and embodied. Um, so as um, someone who's involved in um, racial justice centered work in the United States, the question of who, um, who is allowed to be human and how that plays into the ways that we work with minoritized youth populations in schools, that is a, an issue that's always at the forefront uh, of my research. And so uh, it, it worries me when um, some folks who are involved in, in post-human or, or calling their work post-human move completely away from the human and do not account for the human in assemblages and don't account for themselves. Um, because that actually reinforces a kind of binary thinking. It just moves from the everything's about the human to nothing's about the human. And the same thing happens in both cases, which is you don't account for, right, for yourself and for there. And there is agency, right? It's just a more complex understanding of agency, this entangled agencies. Um, and so, you know, Sylvia Winter has really helped me understand um, and think about this in terms of, um, you know, making an argument for the importance of attending to the human just in those more complex and entangled ways. Um, because she talks about the problem of extra human agency and the ways that, um, you know, folks that have been in power over the centuries um, have used different forms, appointed to different forms of extra human agency to avoid taking accountability for political uh, work that they're doing or things that 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 have those political consequences. Um, and so, you know, over time, whether it's been religion, whether it's been science, whether it's been the invisible hand of the market, um, more uh, recently in the United States, the Supreme Court pointing to the Constitution as an extra human actor that can be used to deny uh, basic rights to women to choose or to, to people who have uteruses to choose whether they will give birth or not. Um, so I think that, you know, again, we always have to account for the human just in that very complex and entangled way. Um, or we risk uh, reproducing you know, the same kind of white supremacist thinking that is so dangerous um, and that, you know, we have this ethical imperative to disrupt as part of larger agendas of, live, you know, finding different ways to understand life and live differently together. Oh, that's uh, quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to first of all turn to the other panelists. Do you want to take any of this in any direction? Responses? Might like to add or disagree or...
Did I leave everybody speechless? Just <laughs> <laughs> it just, you know, we need time to, to respond, I think. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's fine. Maybe I can try to to say something in response. I mean, the first thing to 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 say is that um, diffraction as a methodology, um, what I see happening here does not necessarily have to be um, comply with eye gentle realism, right? So we we mm -hmm. maybe maybe there's a difference to be made, and uh, I I think Katie has in taking something that is useful in defective methodology without necessarily taking on board the entire metaphysics of identity realism. So some of what you have been saying wouldn't quite go with my understanding of this new uh, metaphysics that goes, that resituates the locus of agency, right? Where um, that identity cuts are an enactment and the locus is in the interaction, in the action, where um, the basic un units of existences are processes and relationships rather than subjects, right? And how to, I think it is an important question about how do we think about justices and in injustices from such a um, different kind of ontology, right? But uh, diffractive practice may not have to take and maybe I just pose that as a question for discussion too, all the, the metaphysics of identical realism um, on board. So I, I see here some select selection and I'm, I'm doing this and not that, right? Um, so I don't really have a problem with that um, necessarily, unless you're saying you, um, unless you're saying that a defective methodology must be uh, tied to identical realism about what you said at the very beginning, this dichotomy between what is there and what we are producing. I'm reading diffraction in the context of identity realism slightly differently too, that uh, there is nothing there, there outside of the productions, right? So it, it really, what is there matters to be there, right? There is not, there is not a there that doesn't matter, right? But that it is, it is produced, right? It is in the in an ongoing process of production. So, um, what else did you? Yeah. So maybe I I want to just pose it as a question about just to, um, or open it up as a question about the, the necessity to, to take the whole metaphysics on board and and find a diffraction as a useful methodology for for specific uh yeah liberatory pro uh, projects and and i just leave it as question in the room <laughs> maybe and somebody else can pick up there okay thank you thanks astrid is that also a question back to katie maybe it is maybe we should go back to katie first Well, I think one of the things you said was it doesn't have to be a certain thing. And I think that that is, for me, one of the liberatory things about um, this entire shift, right, is that it doesn't exist in isolation. None of these methods exist in isolation. They only exist as you're doing them. I mean, as you pointed out, right, it's a process that's always ongoing and always creating and producing. So I do think in a way it's difficult. I mean, it it isn't ever that this is one thing and this is that thing, right? That this is a correct way and this is not. And, and it's actually something that I struggle with. I think probably we all do, right? When we're trying to put something like a encyclopedia together that its very purpose is to say, this is what this is, right? And, you know, because things are always changing by the time we've put something down on paper, um, you know, it's become something else. And when it's on paper, it becomes that tracing, it becomes that abstract concept. And so, right, it doesn't ever come back to life until you then put it to work. And so what you do with diffraction and how you understand it, I'm sure is, is very different. Um, and so, you know, rather than particular methods of, of doing things, I think that exist out in the world, I do think it's more useful to just talk about those situated examples. And here's what it works for me, you know, um, the question of the human 
I do think is an ethical political one. Again, you know, how that comes to pass is going to be different for everyone. Um, but in terms of, look, you know, in the context of these larger injustices, I do think it's important um, to think about what that does, um, you know, and, and how we account for the human um, or for subjectivity for the agent, the agency, right? These entangled agencies, however you want to call it. And I also think too, like, there's just this inherent tension in having these conversations because in order to talk about something, you have to linearize it, right? To be able to communicate it. And so unfortunately, you know, I always sometimes question myself, like, oh, when I talk about these things, you know, is it going to come out where somebody's going to say to me, well, you're putting that in a binary because often you have to linearize something to talk about it. And so then I think connecting it back up to those examples to be able to illustrate here's just what I mean in this situated way um, can be can be helpful in that. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Can I go back to, but maybe I misunderstood it, um, but is the question whether there is such a thing as um, a kind of pure way of doing the methodology <laughs> and, um, do you have to buy, I mean, that's what I've always assumed, but maybe that's not true, is that you can diffract without necessarily committing yourself to a particular metaphysics or disruption of a particular metaphysics. Um, see what other people think um, about that. Oh, I, I think, are you want to say something, Astrid? Or you were just, no? Uh -uh. I, um, I have my doubts about whether you can do it from another metaphysics because um, for me it's, it's implicit in the method. If you are not juxtaposing one thing against another, then you're coming from a certain philosophical position. Um, Otherwise, I don't know, how, and I do think that meaningful, for me, meaning, and I'll get back to it when I talk about interpretation, um, meaning is very important and it matters. Um, even though, the, you know, the world is indeterminate, those sort of um, contingent determinacies are important. Um, the agential cuts are important. So um, I don't think it's an anything goes situation at all, actually. For me, it's not anyhow. But I mean, I am not a physicist. And the only way that I have engaged with diffraction is through Haraway and Barad. So I know nothing else. And it sort of makes sense to me from what I've read. Um, you know, the, the way it's described as, as not foregrounding something and backgrounding something else, but as reading them through each other. So, so neither are, are set or given. And I think that is part of the, the philosophy. I'm just concerned it's about time, George, is, is 10 minutes up. Can I just add something I'm, here? Yeah, just hang, hang on one minute. I'm yeah. just need. Why, um, I've been starting the 10 minutes when a new person starts to talk and no one's taken 10 minutes yet. Okay. But 10 minutes okay. from where though, because it's okay. been jumping no around. But definitely on this question we've had, we've been, for more than 10 minutes but yeah more than 10 minutes around no definitely yeah but it's oh yeah 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 so we have to go we to were another jumping group. between everyone okay okay yeah 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 in that case no it really is that we have to then go to another okay, question but first yeah. first of all Malou <laughs> yeah I, would, I just wanted to continue the, the conversation of whether diffraction is something you can just grab and go with or, or, or not but I don't want to mm. 
what I do, or what it's helpful for me to do is, is use or with, uh, diffraction is, is helpful basically um, as a methodology to work from within a, a relational or a processual ontology. So this is how it's mm, the way that it's crafted through Haraway and Barrett, it's, it's, it stems from within a relational and, and processual ontology. And, uh, but what is also, I think, very helpful is um, how it enables um, me to think um, about entanglements and think about how uh, differences uh, that come to matter in the act of uh, diffracting through is uh, are always already entangled with spe uh, specific and different spaces and times. So in the act of diffracting, it's also a possibility of opening up um, uh, different times and places and to see how they are actively part of that thick now or the moment that that uh, the 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 uh, the diffraction is 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 taking place. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that in. So it might I, be yeah, Macalinas. Uh, if, yeah? if I may add on Vives and Malus um, thoughts. I mean, one question that comes in mind is, you know, listening to you is, um, you know, can you diffract anything? Anything? Is there something that cannot be diffracted? So, I mean, somebody who listens to us, it's, it's like, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an obvious question. Are there are limits to what we can diffract or, because earlier you said, well, we've said it, you know, not anything goes. So the question is, you know, is there a limit to this practice or methodology or metaphor or however you want to, um, to call it? Astrid? I actually find this a very interesting question, and it kind of speaks to the to the question number five on your list of questions: uh, Are some texts more generative to diffract than others? And um, I think once we and I'm trying to make the connection back to the metaphysics. Once we um, think of ourselves as living in a processual or a relational world, once we uh, don't think of uh, actors as atoms, uh, independent atoms anymore. As uh, once we don't think of agency um, um, being within a subject, then um, I think um, diffraction is not something we do, but <laughs> the world is diffracting, right? So uh, the world is interacting and uh, no matter whether we want that or not, it is not up to us. It is not up to us to initiate a diffraction. However, I would, and there is a contradiction or paradox here, I do think that certain kinds of texts are more diffractible than other kinds of texts, right? And, um, and that there can be an effort made. Uh, so we are not doing the defection. We are part of defection hap happenings, right? And but there can nevertheless there can be an effort made to uh yeah to um to pay to to pay more attention to the to the happening of the defection, to pay more attention to processes, to pay to foreground what what comes to matter, which which is there anyway, but it is not um, um, whether we diffract or don't diffract. Um, the, the problem here is, as, as always, it's grammar and language because you talk in terms of, of subject, or verb and object. Um, I think that is the, the most difficult uh, thing about uh, really taking on a relational worldview. Um, 
But for example, uh, for example, uh, I, I'm always thinking of Haraway's text that uh, saw where the indeterminacy lives in the text by um, by le leaving it undecided whether certain meanings are metaphorical or literally, for example, right? So there's this kind of, um, and you can't make any meaning without constantly making decisions, constantly fixing something, right? So there is a text that that works, uh, that forces the, the reader to be part of the text uh, in, a, in a very engaging and a very literal way. And there are other texts that are not so, uh, that don't uh, draw you in necessarily to that kind of extent. So <laughs> yeah, for me, it remains a paradox, but uh, um, I don't think that we are diffracting <laughs> uh, if we take on the uh, a gentle realist uh, universe. Fair? So, so ask the, the follow-up question, would you say then we are using the a problematic, not to say wrong, problematic language when we say we are diffracting this with that. Is that problematic? And if yes, should we um, use a different, um, should we invent a different vocabulary that reflects what you just uh, described? I know that Fifth had her yes. hand, <laughs> hang, hang on a minute, Fifth had her hand up for a while. Is it okay, Fifth? that we go for this one first? Does it work out? Yeah, okay. Go in, Astrid. <laughs> oh, I was already done. I was just saying yes and yes to that. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so but I don't, don't ask me about the, the more interesting uh, um, answer would be a, how do we do that, right? Mm -hmm. And the, it's, a, it's a how question that is most important here, but yeah, I don't know. But I, I agree. I would agree. Yeah. Fair? Thanks. Yeah, I, I, we, we actually spoke about this last week. So we were talking about whether there are texts which are more generative to put together. And I would say definitely yes. Whereas I think other people would say no. And I do remember in... Um, meeting the universe halfway when Barad says they're using the very best of social science texts and the very best of, well, I mean, that's obviously their opinion, but of quantum physics tests. Uh, it's Foucault and Butler with um, Niels Bohr. And I do feel that if one puts completely contradictory um, things together, like, um, you know, um, for example, representational and non-representational theory or um, outcomes-based education with processual learning. I'm, I'm not sure how generative that may be. That could be. And I do think that, you know, it is part of a process that, um, and meaning making, or as Barad calls it, sense making, um, is an important part of that process. So following the path of one thing might be much more generative than following the path of something else. Um, I remember the, the jute factory and, you know, looking at um, relations of cost, for example. But I suppose these things do change, you know, all the time. What becomes interesting is not something which is in human control, but the, you know, things happen in the world and new interesting things appear. So, um, yeah, it's not something that one can control, but I do think putting certain things together is more interesting than others. I mean, if you put a, a very um, 
poorly thought out theory together with a very well thought out theory, what, what, what would be the point? Can I just come in here? Because I'm just thinking about, you know, connecting um, your language of putting things together and, you know, your sort of role as maybe as a researcher and I suppose Astrid's invitation to, to trouble um, the language we use in terms of doing something when we diffract. And one of the things, and I've had this conversation a lot of times with one of my PhD researchers about, um, for example, developmental psychology or, and how you can maybe diffract through that. So then what does that actually mean? And I think the last sort of when I was listening this weekend to those three recordings, what must be actually quite hard. And also now again, this conversation for people doing their PhD is, well, yeah, but where does that leave me actually? <laughs> you, know, as a, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to be doing something, but am I, am I not doing something? So if we take a step back and when I say, oh, you know, um, Piaget, can I just defect through Piaget, for example? which actually people have done quite productively not long ago. Um, then what does that mean in terms, because it's already so um, clouded or um, influenced by, you know, my take or, or everyone, the discourses that are so, if, if, I mean, the way I understand it's sort of, the methodology is is to doing justice to these fine details so what it would mean is to study um is there such a thing as a theory anyway you know the readings and then the text and then come to it as you know in a different way and then also without um assuming certain binaries and letting questions cascade and um so i suppose what i'm troubling here is maybe the idea that there are such things as text as units as bodies that we put together um and so if we take away that idea that there is such a thing as a text um uh anyway then um what does it require as part of you know in that diffractive engagement um not quite sure where i'm going with this but it it, it is um <laughs> It's almost as if you already preempt the conclusion before you even start it. And is that a doing justice to the complexity of the phenomenon that you are examining? If you already preempt whether something is a good text or not, whether it's porous or not, whether we can diffract through it or not without having even done it yet. But even done it yet is already like, <laughs> done it yet who has done it yet um but i mean there's so you know we are at sea in the the number of texts in the world um so i think it does require some sort of discernment to because you could spend all your life on um piaget and, you know, diffracting Piaget through another developmental theorist, but would it be interesting? Yeah, I think it would be, but also if we take it, I mean, I've been diffracting through one photo for two years. Um, and actually it becomes more and more interesting as, as you stay with it. And that's also what I very much learned, you know, when, Malou came and um, when Astrid, you did your presentation and how um, 
you know, the tracing of the phenomenon is, is, is endless, it's infinite. It's, um, so maybe, maybe it's also helpful to think about texts differently. Well, if I could just respond to that too, I, I, I love that idea, um, you know, and, and the questions that you're bringing up in terms of, you know, what's a text? How do we decide if it's good from the beginning? Um, and in, in my work, you know, I work with students uh, who are leaders who are, you know, embedded in, the, in very constrained systems. Um, you know, Viv, you had mentioned, you know, outcomes-based education. And so they're forced as part of their jobs you know, to carry out these standardized tests that we know are linguistically and, and you know, culturally, racially biased um, and reproduce inequities. And yet none of them exist outside the system. And what I've seen over and over again um, is when things are presented to them where they're having difficulty making the connection to this very constrained environment, um, they can resist and shut down and just not engage at all. But, um, really respond well to the notion of lines of flight. And it makes me think about when you're putting some of these, um, you know, agential realism or Deleuze Guitarian concepts or, um, you know, Barad's work and you're putting it together and entangling it with the system that they have to work in, which is of course based in um, some of these theories that, you know, we uh, critique as, as reductive and, you know, quite actively harmful to be honest. Um, but because, you know, that's what they have to deal with. And it's, uh, you know, I agree, absolutely not the most productive theory to work with. Um, but those are the systems that they live in. And so in bringing those together and figuring out where are the lines of flight, you know, I wonder if that could be an instance in which that could be product, that could be a, a productive example. So, and that it's just, again, it's something I think about a lot in, in working with students and trying to help them. Um, make these ontopistemological shifts, um, but just finding entry points for them from the systems that are so constrained that they often can't uh, can't see, you know, smooth spaces where um, they can they can help mobilize change. Um, I'm just thinking, is there one of the questions panelists you would like to respond to in particular? We've sort of been jumping mm. like a ball from one to the next to the next, which is quite nice, mm. but there might be, yeah. If I can add from just a timekeeping point of view, I have been, but um, because it's been jumping, it didn't really feel necessary to interrupt, or cut anyone short, but that we do have. 30 minutes left. I'm quite interested in the one on interpretation. Okay, fire away. <laughs> um, well, the, 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 the notion came up because as I don't know if everyone was here in the beginning, but um, we were asked to write a paper, Michelinos and myself, on which responded to interpretation and how interpretation speaks to diffraction and, and reflection. Um, so, you know, it, I think it was quite an interesting exercise because it really... Uh, I, well, certainly for me, it made me think very hard about um, reflection and how reflection is not just one thing. Um, Astrid, you were talking about deconstruction. So, I mean, um, Wonder Pillow talks about different kinds of reflection. And I think reflection and reflexivity, you know, which has been a feminist practice for years, um, has a bit of ba bad press. I don't think it is just all about mirroring at all. Um, so, I mean, part of that reflexivity is genealogy, which is exactly what I think Barad is proposing with um, 
a, a diffractive following of something in a material way. Perhaps her, uh, their um, following is much more material discursive. But I think um, it's still about um, the material discursive. It's still, a, you know, meaning making is still very um, part of the diffractive process, I think. Um, I don't know if you want to come in at all, Michelinos. Um, yes, I mean, let me answer the question directly. Are some concepts, concepts beyond rescue? Of course, yes. <laughs> I just don't think that interpretation is just one of those, not yet. And that's what we try to to do in the in the chapter. I mean, um, to um, basically reclaim it through the notion of sense making. And um, it's interesting to hear our conversation uh, earlier, both Astrid and um, Karin. At least I I noted down. You you use the notion of meaning in in your. Um, in your conversation. So I don't think that we can get away and completely, you know, throw in the trash the notion of, of meaning. I just think it's an interesting intellectual and political exercise to reclaim it through this new, um, through this new um, way of thinking, like diffracting analysis. Um, um, have we done it successfully in this chapter? Maybe not, you know, maybe it needs more work. Uh, but I think um, uh, the, the intellectual exercise is worthwhile. I think politically also is worthwhile. And that's what, uh, that's what we tried uh, to do through uh, reclaiming, uh, reclaiming the notion, using the notion of, of um, Barat's notion of, of sense making. So that's the short answer. The long answer, we'll talk about another time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, just to go back to interpretation in qualitative research, I mean, what is objected to is that the, um, say, the participants that one interviews um, one is searching for the meaning that they are portraying. Um, and, you know, that, that might be dependent on one's um, theoretical position as uh, um, who are those two who, who wrote the book on thinking with theory? Um, Lisa Matze and... <laughs> yeah, Jackson I would say. showed that, you know, the same question and the same set of data, um, depending on, you know, what lens one uses, you come to completely different um, understandings of it. But, uh, but as I said before, one does not necessarily need um, a theoretical lens. I think it's... It has to do with whole histories and ways of being in the world, which lead one to make assumptions. The person that we read on interpretation also distinguished between quantitative research, which is looking for causality, and qualitative research in the interpretive term, which, which is looking more for meaning. Um, so I think that we haven't thrown out the meaning. Um, and uh, yeah, that it, it is actually possible to, to use, use it in a different way. Okay. Is there anybody here who says that it's beyond rescue? <laughs> <laughs> um, Malou, I just used your term. I'm not saying, I'm not, not putting that in your mouth, but I just used, you raised that question. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, we had that conversation over um, 
your your beautiful paper just like uh, half an hour after I had just read it. Uh, so I, I was trying to figure out what I thought about rescuing or not rescuing interpretation. I think you are totally entitled to do so. And there are also, I guess, good political or sort of scientific or good reasons for doing so. And you, you, you have good, um, you make a good case for that. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with it, but I, I come from a tradition that does have a problem with the with the term of interpretation. So the, I was sort of responding with that sort of uh, background. And um, Katie mentioned Betty St. Pierre and Hesse Leather when she started, and and so I've been reading those people's texts for for decades and. And the whole discussion of how uh, qualitative inquiries had over the years um, become um, sort of a, po a positivist endeavor. Uh, so this was their critique of why do we have to sort of uh, uh, throw away these concepts and you know work the ruins and <laughs> leave behind the father's paradigm and all of these wonderful punchlines of what we need to just do something different. So uh, so this was sort of my um, my reasons for um, having a difficult time getting my head around re sort of rescuing interpretation as a term. Um, so yeah, I, but I would be interested to know how sense making is different. How Barad's notion of sense making is different from different interpretation. interpretation. I would too. Is there anyone who might, you know, be willing to offer their thoughts on on what that difference might be? Astrid. Yeah, I was actually was gonna pose this question to you. Uh, um, with why sense making the way broad conceiver is a material practice right so why not using sense making that as uh where the materiality of of the practice is much easier to envision than a historically problematic term uh such as interpretation that is not that is so easily associated with something that happens in a mind and uh I mean, um, I think what you're trying to do is also making it a material practice, but if it's the same, why not call it sense making, right? So um, I do understand so, and actually uh, I had a similar conversation in a completely different context where a colleague of mine was a philosopher was asked, why do you keep using the, the notion of mind? And the answer was because I'm a philosopher. I need to I, I need to stay intelligible to a certain kind of audience. And maybe there is a similar answer there. Um, that for historical reasons, um, but for somebody not in the field, um, that kind of answer, um, yeah. So there is something um, that I'm not quite grasping yet. What are the historical reasons that? make you want to hang on to or reconfigure interpretation as sense making. This may be the, <laughs> the historical reasons are because we were um, forced into doing it. That was the historical reason. And yeah. it was it was um you know <laughs> it was a it was a way of um you know knocking one's head and hitting one's head and thinking, well, how on earth can this be done? But I did do a search of interpretation in Meeting the Universe Halfway, and it's used extensively. In, in the, the sense book. of quantum interpretation, because that is also exactly. a historical way. It's an interpretation of the world, yeah. But um, I think... Yeah. But it, it, it again, okay. it's um, whether it is something that is posed, you know, in the context of a special issue or a theme of a conference, you know, when we invited at conferences and 
you've got to address a particular theme or you know in itself it's still the, the question lingers you know what uh, what are the limits in which we can um, and we reconfigure all the time reconfiguring teaching is something that I have been doing reconfiguring philosophy itself um, you know is something that uh, you know for example the notion of post philosophy for example fifth that you use I mean for me no you know it's philosophy <laughs> post philosophy is also philosophy so I think what what these what these questions um, generate is, is fascinating because it is, can you walk around in anything, in any concept um, or, you know, or, and even by abandoning it doesn't mean that therefore it doesn't exist, right? And so one of the things that I have found incredibly helpful by also secondary literature, but also by Barat and, and others, is to think about, oh, okay, so when I interpret this image, what can I do? Because I'm still stuck in this language, right, as a researcher. And then, okay, let myself be affected by, okay, other, other ways. Oh, what, what would a geography, what, what does, how can I look differently at this? Oh, and there are ways in which you can um look differently and i think the looking is is deliberate here you know you can you can change your optics and i think again that is if i don't gaze at whatever it is i'm looking at through a human gaze but i think what else might be possible what if i change my because we've only been talking about metaphorical lenses but what about the you know other lenses that through which we can look at this so it is, it is playful uh, in, a very, in a very important and a very sense uh, way of talking about play. And, and um, what, I mean, I, I just want to abandon the, the thing of interpretation itself as something that, whether that in itself should be abandoned, but it, it does raise the much larger question about uh, our relation to concepts that we, uh, yeah, that think us and we think with, and, you know, what, what can we do with that? And, and, you know, even the notion, I mean, what sense making for me immediately gets me in the wrong, uh, you know, in the wrong way at all, you know, as a philosopher, sense making doesn't do it for me at all. Um, but it would be for for other people, and and so um, what are what and what are concepts anyway? So you know that is is the. But it will be interesting now. I'm looking at time to see also whether non-panelists uh, setting up this binary of the panelists and the non-panelists uh, other people in the room uh, who would like to maybe pose your question in the chat or um, you don't have to put up your hands oh Temi uh, she has to leave uh, first. I didn't even know Temi was in the room she must have been in a Temi where are you no Temi is already gone um, anybody you can just come in, you uh, can say it, you can write it, you can put up your hand. Um, And did you want to say something? I, I suppose I, I was thinking about um, whether we can really know what a concept does in advance of when it sort of 
materializes with us. Um, sort of the, the idea that I almost don't want to, um, don't want to make assumptions about, about what a concept can do before, before it's used. Um, and, and the way in which it can be used like a dozen different times and produce a dozen different, um, you know, apparatuses and, and, um, I suppose I, I've had this, this sort of, um, the specter in the back of my mind about, um, there's this scene from the film, uh, Watchmen where, uh, there's a description of someone who, who emerged from, you know, from all of the possibilities in the world, you know, and, and from such violence that, that this person emerged as perfection. And I, I sort of, I always think about like the possibility of encountering concepts or ideas that, that otherwise I might find monstrous or impossible um, and the sorts of uh, radical possibilities that are, that uh, often surprise you, um, uh, and to sort of to yeah se second guess the the any firmness of a concept. Hmm. It's a lovely expression, actually, the firmness, boundedness of a concept, yeah. Anyone? Maybe just to clarify a little bit what I, um, um, so that I won't be misunderstood, I didn't argue for giving up interpretation, right? My, one, one way to see that, I, I really uh, buy this argument that holding on to something for historical reasons or for intelligibility for a certain audience, uh, similar to Katie's insistence earlier on the human agency for, for the very specific kind of justice projects, right? Maybe not all justice projects, but there are projects for which it might be important to hold on to to our primary human agency, um, I do see both uh, decisions as identical cuts, right? Uh, so they could be read in in a certain way that those are uh, the cuts are made at a different uh, at a different part than maybe I would make them, but they they are nevertheless identical cuts that. Um, enable certain practices rather than others for which then um, responsibility has to be taken. And I think that is, that is part of the project. So interpretation after, uh, after this essay means something else. <laughs> it's something else in the world, right? Um, so, um, so I don't have a problem with that, even though I wouldn't do it myself that way, right? One could read it as, um, yeah, the the knot has a different, uh, yeah, a different genealogy or content. I don't know if that made sense or helped at all. Hmm. I I think I think sort of speaking back to what what Katie was saying before is. Uh, is uh, it's also interesting to look at um, uh, the way in which so, so often we deal with concepts that are defanged, you know, the, the sorts of um, the way in which um, concepts like interpretation or social justice can be rendered meaningless in their, in, their, in their use in particular ways. And so being conscious about like, um, the way in which any any concept can be sort of defanged in that sense, um, and and also staying conscious about what what would defang diffraction, um, what what would defang agential cuts? How how do we render them meaningless? Um, because I don't think that they're invulnerable to that. Mm -mm.
I totally agree with that. There and I actually said something really uh, pertinent to that, what you just said. He was saying deconstruction is justice. As long as you, and, and if you, in this case, uh, um, render what you compare that to rendering meaningless, as, as long as a process of deconstruction is going on, there is, there is the possibility for justice. Once you have found a solution, once you have found the, the theory of the world, there is no more justice, right? <laughs> this is totalitarianism, right? So it's it kind of, I completely agree that, yes, I gentle cats are also deconstructive. <laughs> they must be, they must be um, from, from my way of thinking. You took you, you said Derrida, yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, they are but, not the last word either. <laughs> but doesn't Derrida say that justice will never come? It's not ever possible. Um, and um, the sense making is sort of examining how the agential cuts came to be. You know how a concept was made through a gentle cut. I think. Well, I I also think again that comes back to that entangled notion of agency, and there is no such thing as a concept that exists apart from context, right? Going and and again, you know, it it does. It goes back to um, the particular onto epistemologies right, that we're engaging with, um, and that it's, right, if, if we are, um, you know, engaging with the, the notion of imminence, that all of us are connected and entangled, and there is nothing outside, um, right, then concepts also don't exist outside, there's no abstract, um, so, you know, again, it comes back to the notion of the entanglement of human agency and us being uh, accountable for, uh, you know, what we are putting the concepts in conversation with, how we are entangled with them, all of the other sort of contextual pieces that are um, producing that situated meaning. And so I think for me, like going back to the idea of meaning and sense making, um, I mean, working in science education, meaning and sense making also have particular um, notions and I, I appreciate the conversation on intentional language in terms of which audiences you're talking to and being strategic. Um, but, you know, I think that situated meaning for me is just always what it comes back to that yes, of course, there are no abstracts. You know, the meanings are being produced. It doesn't mean it's neutral. Absolutely. I mean, you're also accounting for political flows that are engaged in that production. Um, and so, yeah. To me, it's it's impossible. Um, you know, it just comes back to me in terms of just being accountable for what are those agential cuts. That always has been like a very useful concept for me of the agential cuts um, to be able to discuss those contextual connections that are producing that particular meaning. I suppose for me, it's it's um, it makes sense that material arrangements are actually you know, what produce concepts, you know, the whole thing of the position and momentum, it's, you can only get it, you know, those things under particular conditions or material arrangements. So I think that, that's what um, agential realism sort of is, how it's different and what, what it offers that's different, which is, very useful, I find. Takes it out of the human mind and sphere. Well, does it? Does it really? And if so, how? Because that comes back to the, the, the kind of the complexity, the, the, the contradiction. Um, of the human and the non, you know, the non-human, or the decentering, and um, I think the humans can be part of those material arrangements, or they need not be. It can happen without humans around. The event 
can, you know, it can happen in the event or it can happen in the material arrangements. And just, um, I, I kind of feel as though we've been talking about sense making as a, as a human practice, but in fact, there are other forms of life and non-life that are involved in sense making and in reading Absolutely. their environment. And I mean, it seems to me also, for me, sense making is, is um, fully embodied it's not just located in mind, and it requires staying with something, uh, attention, letting it speak to you. It doesn't necessarily happen when you will it to happen. You know, it's about it's about letting letting st stuff speak to you in relation, or affect you in relation. Mm. That to me is more is the difference between sense making and interpretation. And Karen, I'm interested if, if that gels with anything that you're thinking of, why as a philosopher, you, you don't go with sense making, which is more post-human than interpretation maybe. No, because of it has a very particular um, there we go. I wouldn't say context necessarily, but it is situated in, um, you know, very particular discourses philosophically, which I, I, I would, it would get me on the wrong footing, as it were. It would walk, make me walk in, a, in, a, in the wrong direction. But I, but I think it's, um, but I, I just lost now what I was going to say but it can't have been that no I've just I've just lost the um that particular you're saying that Barad is using sense making in a in no no a, no 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 in a frame that's already occupied by <laughs> other uses of sense making that interfere yeah, I mean, I think uh, all the time is that, you know, what, that's the interesting thing. What, what appeals to you? What, 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 you know, there was attunement talked about last week and as opposed to paying attention because then that's something that you do, you know, that is a kind of agency in it. And I think what we especially, you know, what is different when we talk about event or what is different between living a life and being part of a world that's worlding itself, where you have the human and the more than human making sense and all of that. And people here in the room, quite a lot of you who have to produce a PhD and you have to write something and put it and we've got to write, right? So that's a doing. And I think what one of the, the real difficulties is, okay, so, if I'm not supposed to be doing anything and if it's not, and I think one of the, um, uh, I think you started Katie, which I thought was helpful also for, for th that there are no, um, you know, I think we have to be careful that we don't set up these kind of holy um, houses almost where, um, you know, when you were mentioning, it's just a more complex kind of agency and so complexifying uh, the doings, the complexifying of, and always being aware of the binaries that we bring to those practices. Because you see, if it is like, it's a, it's a material thing, I'm always already worried, so, but it, there is no such thing. I mean, we can, we can talk about the world worlding itself, but uh, I, I am the one who's noticing when I talk about it, right? So always in the here and now, it is a me in whatever, uh, however I configure myself, but there is a me who is doing that. So, but what is what does that mean that doing? And I think that, um, Yeah, it is, it's, it's beautifully complex. That's, that's why it's exciting. We started off talking about what, what excites 
And I think that's why, especially essential realism, I think is incredibly exciting because it's, it's, it's doing justice to the complexity of the world that we find ourselves in. Um, but maybe we should just dump research <laughs> that maybe then um, uh, it's, it would solve a few problems. But um, have we got a last kind of, it is time. And I would just love to um, thank the panelists and mm. everyone else that there wouldn't be a panelist or a panel without people who are not panelists, I suppose. Um, and for the people who have organized this event, and of course, Roseanne and Viv, uh, always part of the administration of the all the events that we organize. And George, I mean, hey, let's just give a, a big round of applause for, um, first of all, George, for making always this, this possible and the project, but also, for all of you uh, panelists, thank you. And um, fortunately, it's just delightful that we've got this recording and that we can go back to it again and again and keep returning uh, to this uh, and defect through it. And thank you very much for your time. I know we are so incredibly crazy, too busy. And um, yeah, it's very special. So thank you. And, um, and go well and enjoy your day, evening, wherever you are, and your mother presence. Bye, Take everyone. care. Bye-bye.